Greetings. Uh, this is Dr. I'm Dr. Gladys Kalema Zuksoka from Conservation Through Public Health. I'm going to talk about our One Health approach to promoting gorilla conservation. I've been working with gorillas for 25 years and starting off as a researcher, then the first veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority. And then later on, we set up a non-profit, an NGO called Conservation Through Public Health that promotes biodiversity conservation by enabling people to coexist with gorillas and other wildlife to improving their health and livelihoods. Along the way, we also started doing family planning um, using a population health and environment approach. And that's when we came into contact with Population Connection. We're really pleased that Population Connection has invited me for the speaker series. I first wrote an article for the Reporter magazine. And then later on, I also gave a talk at the annual Capitol Hill Days. That was in 2015. And one of our staff went over, Diana, Dr. Diana Nalwanga in 2016. And Population Connection has continued to support our work. It has been one of our major donors and helped, and we're so grateful for the Giving Tuesday fundraiser that was done last month. I'm going to talk to you about the work that we're doing in COVID-19, um, preventing disease between people and animals in and around protected areas in Africa. What is COVID-19? It's a novel coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2, caused by SARS-CoV-2. And it has been found that COVID-19 is life-threatening. It affects the lower respiratory tract. The biggest signs are difficulty breathing, it also cause, creates a cough. Um, so unfortunately, it's as contagious as the common flu, but life-threatening as the previous outbreaks such as severe acute respiratory syndrome and the Middle East respiratory syndrome, which actually cause death. The common flu doesn't necessarily cause death that much, but it's extremely infectious. And COVID has both characteristics, which makes it a very virulent virus, which unlike the previous epidemics like SARS and MERS, has gone to many more people. As many as 8.3 million people are affected so far and 450,000 deaths. What makes it more infectious as well is that 80% of people don't show symptoms, but they can spread the disease. And in Uganda, we've been very lucky. We've only had 732 cases and no confirmed deaths. And this, we've been very lucky because we don't actually have the facilities to cope with a lot of sick people and people needing a lot of intensive care. So what caused it? Where did it come from? There have been many debates about where it came from, but I think everybody agrees that it was a bat coronavirus. Um, just as bats have been implicated with SARS, where the immediate intermediate host was seabed cats, and in MERS, where the intermediate host was dromedary camels. Um, this was in the Middle East. With SARS-CoV-2, the immediate host has been suspected to be a pangolin, but this hasn't yet been proven. And research is still undergoing to find out exactly which is the intermediate host. But everybody seems to agree that it came from the Wuhan wet market, where animals which are live, such as pangolins, civets, those kind of species, bats are kept in tiny cages. They get very stressed, and the virus can easily jump from the animals to the people. And in China, I was very upset to see that the bat and dog markets were reopened. And this is, if we want to prevent the next pandemic, we have to stop the markets for live wild animals that uh, can easily harbor coronaviruses that can cause such severe death and disruption to not only people's health, but the world economy, which is right now on its knees. Coronavirus is also spread through fecal contamination and not only through droplets. So it's extremely infectious and it's spreading in so many ways. And each time we're learning more about it. I've been working with the mountain gorillas for a very long time. This is Kanyonyi, one of my favorite gorillas. And I was hired as the first veterinarian for the Uganda Wildlife Authority in 1996 to address diseases such as COVID-19. Um, fatal flus that can come to the critically endangered mountain gorillas and wipe them out. There's only just over 1,000 left in the world, but however, their numbers have doubled since I first started working with them in the 1990s from 650 
to 1,063. Gorillas are threatened by habitat loss in all the places they're found in the wild, and Uganda is no exception. Um, also by poaching. Poaching is not for the gorillas themselves within Uganda and Rwanda, but it's more for the other animals that people like to eat, such as daika and bush pig, and gorillas get caught in snares, or sometimes they come face to face with severe injuries through inter interacting with people. Um, unfortunately, gorillas go outside the park a lot. We have a very hard edge in Brindy, as you can see from here. And this is brought about by the very high human population growth, which is a reason why we address family planning in communities bordering the park. It's as high as 600 people, 300 to 600 people per square kilometer. But here we have the gorilla that died of scabies, um, a skin disease in the, which created baby gorilla to die and the rest only recovered with treatment. The more common name is sarcoptic mange and it came from people living around the park who have very little health care and information on zoonotic diseases. And this time around the gorillas got it from the local community and not from the tourists who we, who we greatly suspected would be the ones that would make them very sick when they came to visit them in the park. Um, the gorillas eat banana plants and eucalyptus trees outside the park and people put out dirty clothing to scare away scarecrows, for scarecrows to scare away the wildlife. And this is how they ended up getting the scabies. Over here, you can see tourists um, viewing gorillas in the park. And this is the main way that we are concerned about them picking up diseases. Here, the tourists are maintaining the seven meter distance, which is ideal. And this is what we aim for. Um, and as long as they maintain a distance, we can prevent diseases such as the human metanemovirus in Rwanda, that was where they found that the strain was from South Africa, and they thought that it most likely came from tourists. There's been lethal respiratory disease in chimps in Uganda, in Kibale National Park. They think it came from the local community. It was caused by the human rhinovirus C. Both these viruses and the human coronavirus in Ivory Coast, which they came, think came from either researchers or the local community, and this outbreak occurred. Uh, no chimpanzees died in this outbreak, but some showed mild symptoms and it came from the local community. Unfortunately, in Uganda, as many as five chimpanzees died and in Rwanda, two gorillas died from diseases related to humans. I'd like to point out that all these diseases are part of the common flu, um, but sometimes as COVID-19, we found that the same coronavirus mutated several times and now became extremely dangerous, affecting the lower respiratory tract. COVID-19 has spread from unsymptomatic zookeepers to tigers and lions at the Bronx Zoo in New York, as well as pets. And this is something to worry about. And also, although COVID-19 has not spread to any primates, either in zoos, I mean to any gorillas, either in zoos or in the wild, we know that gorillas, great apes and other old world primates are very susceptible to COVID-19 because the SARS-CoV-2 virus easily attaches to the, to the ACE2 protein receptors of humans, which are, and these same receptors are exactly the same in great apes. So we know that they are highly susceptible to COVID-19. How do we prevent it? We decided that we needed to jump into action and prevent it spreading from people to the great apes. We held a training workshop with the rangers who are the people who take tourists to the gorillas and who monitor the gorillas every day. We work closely with the Uganda Wildlife Authority um, who asked us to do the training, Mountain Gorilla Vet Project, International Gorilla Conservation Program, and the Max Planck Institute. When you come to track gorillas, for those of you who are lucky enough to do so, and I encourage you to do so after the pandemic is over, um, this is the kind of briefing you get. You're not allowed to go closer than seven meters. And they talk about that a lot. Um, this is how long and how far seven meters is. However, when research was conducted with researchers from Ohio University, of which I was also involved, we found that even if 98% of the time tourists were being told not to go close to the gorillas, 60% of the time the tourists broke the rules, they got closer than seven meters, and 40% of the time the gorillas broke the rules because they're so used to seeing tourists, like you saw in Kanyoni, the first gorilla that I showed you, he's grew up all his life seeing tourists and even liked to frighten them and see their reaction. So we reinforce the rules. If you're sick or you have a flu or cloth, you're not allowed to go into the forest. 
Um, all people visiting the gorillas have to have their temperatures checked using non-contact infrared thermometer. Um, the very first index case that came into Uganda did not have a flu or a cough. The main thing they had was a very high temperature. And this is something that people are used to because when we've had Ebola outbreaks in DRC, um, neighboring DRC, the use of infrared thermometers helped a lot to check out for asymptomatic carriers before they spread the disease. We also really reinforce mandatory hand washing and everyone moves with a sun hand sanitizer, which they use before they start trekking. Here I am demonstrating the use of a thermometer with uh, staff from Bwindi Community Hospital, which is right in Bwindi. It's a very good hospital, um, health center to the level of a health center four and now a big host, a regional hospital within that small area where COVID-19 patients can go if or people have suspected to have COVID-19 can go for an initial check. So one thing that we introduced was wearing of masks. It hasn't been done before. And this is a very big upgrade in the gorilla viewing rules. So now if anyone's visiting the gorillas, they have to wear masks, whether it's the park staff checking on them or tourists or researchers or vets. And the viewing, the seven meter distance was enforced. You have to dig a hole 30 centimeters deep, especially as we know that COVID also spreads through fecal material. And here I am when we went out for the practical training with one of the head rangers, she's a female vet, a female ranger called Goretti. And here we were observing the gorillas under the seven meter rule. And we're really excited that it worked out well. And we had cloth masks because when we started out, we found that there were no more surgical masks in Uganda at the time. But somebody from CDC, who I met because we sit on the COVID-19 task force, the Ministry of Health, said a cloth mask with lining is as good as a surgical mask for preventing disease from you to the gorillas. And so we went ahead and did that, and that's what they're all using right now. So COVID-19 enabled us to review the great A viewing regulations, and anyone visiting gorillas or chimpanzees has to follow these regulations. CTPH donated infrared thermometers to the Uganda Wildlife Authority for all their trekking sites. We're really pleased about that. And other gorilla conservation NGOs have come up to donate, including International Gorilla Conservation Program and the Gorilla Organization. And we're really pleased to be able to help. And the interesting thing now is that tourists are now demanding that they don't make the gorillas and the chimps sick. And they're very happy to wear masks and make sure their temperatures are taken, which is great because of the main people we wanted to influence in order to prevent such diseases occurring. But the gorillas also go outside the park. And uh, when working as a first vet for the Uganda Wildlife Authority, I developed these brochures because we wanted to prevent disease when the gorillas go to people's gardens, seeing that they, con they contracted scabies from people. And we decided to train the human and gorilla conflict resolution team, who we also call gorilla guardians because they basically protect the gorillas and they're from the community and they train them in all the same things we train the park staff in, how to prevent disease between people and from people to gorillas, and how it, the importance of taking temperatures before you go out. And this is the community conservation ward in Barbara, giving them the training. And we use these, these posters, which were developed with support from Solidaridad, and ACAS Foundation funded the training for the human gorilla conflict team and the village health and conservation teams. So through these, we've added a photograph of a gorilla. People have to call out the, the warden of research and monitoring and community conservation if they see a gorilla and they call out the Hugo members who had them back when they were in masks and make sure that they are not sick before they had them back. And in this way, we're protecting the gorillas from getting diseases from the local community. It's also done in the local language. And uh, we also train now 270 village health and conservation teams who are found in the six parishes where there's high human and gorilla conflict. We're training them in good hygiene and sanitation. Uh, we reinforced that. We added COVID-19 to the package that we're already training them in. And we've also told them to co-manage COVID-19 and TB because the symptoms are very similar, difficulty breathing and coughing for a long time. And the Ministry of Health says that they should now be co-managed and we've emphasized that. We've also continued with promoting voluntary family planning. A lot of women are already getting the three monthly depot injection. And uh, we're also talking about nutrition, sustainable agriculture, which we're realizing now is becoming much more urgent 
um, which I'll explain later in the presentation. We're reporting homes visited by gorillas and promoting awareness on zoonotic diseases and the importance of the forest and not to poach and why it's important to protect the gorillas. Even if tourists are not coming right now, it's very important to continue to protect the gorillas. Um, we got support from Family Health International and trained the volunteers to give Depo Provera injections, working closely with the local health centers. So they give them, and this became the most popular contraception, contraception method for the local communities. And they, they have continued doing it and they keep doing it. And even during COVID-19, we're encouraging them to keep doing it. So that's very important. The, the family planning services that have not been able to continue so much are the ones where people have to go to the hospital for treatment because all transport, all non-essential travel was stopped and they couldn't even get on a border border, which is the local transport to go. And they're encouraging people to stay at home to prevent the spread of the disease. But with uh, things like the Depopovera Depo injection, these volunteers are found in people's homes, and in people's villages, and it's easy for somebody to walk over to her home. It could be a five minute walk, 10 minute walk, 20 minute walk, but it doesn't, it doesn't take a lot for them to go and visit. And all these volunteers have now been given masks so that when people come to visit them, they're, not, they're less likely to pick up diseases or give them to them. We've also given them hand sanitizers and liquid soap so that they keep spreading this same message. And these posters are also being put up in public places. And of course, with the training, it's all done with social distancing taken into consideration and everybody is many meters apart from each other. So in the absence of tourism, how do we ensure that wildlife is protected? Over here is the Entebbe duty free shop where I, we've had our biggest customer. They used to order coffee every week, but they haven't ordered since March. It's such a big shame, but most of our customers were tourists. And when there was lockdown all over the world and tourism was suspended in Uganda as well, um, we've not been having those customers. And we have to look for other ways to support the local communities in the absence of tourism. Um, and one of them is providing gorilla conservation coffee for people who are not able to travel to Uganda. We are also working with Right for a Woman who's making masks for people coming into close contact with gorillas. And even if they lost a market by tablecloths, not being able to make tablecloths for the local community, they're able to make masks. So they're able to still earn some kind of a living. And we are getting involved in drives, fundraising drives for the different, edu the wildlife education center and the chimpanzee island and providing food for the most vulnerable. So here, Right for a Woman have been making masks They've made many masks for the local communities, for the farmers of the gorilla conservation coffee, for the village health teams, for the human and gorilla conflict team, gorilla guardians, for the park staff, for anyone who's working around Gwindi, they're the go-to people to make the masks, which is great because we're keeping the women um, having employed and having an income. So I'll talk a little bit about gorilla conservation coffee. It's a global brand that we're building to save gorillas one sip at a time. When you're tracking gorillas, you cross coffee farms. And this lady over here is picking coffee. And this is Arabica premium coffee. It's very good coffee, um, even as good as a specialty market and earned 92 points in 2018 and was among the top 30 coffees in the world. So that they reviewed that year. Um, so we're buying coffee from farmers at 50 cents per kilo above the market price and selling it at a higher price to traders, roasters and retailers. And a donation from every bag sold also goes to support the work of CTPH, community health, gorilla health, and conservation education work. Um, and this coffee is basically mainly sold in America through pangos.com, but we're so glad that Population Connection was one of our first buyers. In 2017, Population Connection um, bought 500 bags for their members, um, individual donors in America, and that was so fantastic, and we bought 500, 250 gram bags. And I hope some of you members go to taste some of this delicious coffee, but it's now available through pangos.com. And also very recently we got market from the United Kingdom um, from Money Row Beans. Vicky Wendo ordered coffee during the COVID-19 pandemic. She got her first order in May, has just placed another order now. And she's been able to give, sell coffee to people and people are then able to still support gorillas without visiting them. And especially now in the COVID-19 pandemic, when people are really starving. Unfortunately, because people are so hungry, um, Rafiki, one of the most well-known gorillas at Bwindi was killed. 
at the beginning of June. On 1st June, his body was found. And um, it was when a postmortem was done, spear, he was speared by a poacher. And why would a poacher kill Rafiki? It's something we keep asking ourselves. But there's a lot of hunger in the area since tourism has, is over. There's no tourism right now. It's suspended until the pandemic is over, especially primate tourism. And this poacher was actually caught. He's eventually caught. Um, and they found a lot of meat at his home. And this meat was not for gorillas. It was for daika and bush pigs. Um, these poachers like to eat the daika and bush pig. It's a meat that has always eat, has been eaten for a long time. And he was also going to sell it in the market. He's hungry. His family is hungry. Many people around him are hungry. And he knew he had a market. He went into the park to check on his snares. And he came across Rafiki. And Rafiki is so used to seeing people. He doesn't know who's good and who's bad. And this poacher maybe got scared that he was so close to a gorilla and he speared him out of panic. But he shouldn't have speared him because everybody in the community knows what the gorilla has done. $10 from every gorilla permit, 20% of every from the park entry fee goes to the local community. They've been lifted out of poverty, many of them, because of the mountain gorilla. Gorilla trekking tourists come. People, porters earn so much money. Um, in one day, they can earn the same as someone would earn in a month just by carrying somebody's bags up to the gorillas. So it's very sad, but it's made us realize that people are so poor because there are no tourists coming. They've stopped, they gave up farming to do tourism, and we need to encourage them to go back to farming. And one of the things that we're trying to do to address this issue, such as Rafiki being killed by the poacher, is promoting you know, fast growing food crops that they can eat, giving them seedlings so that they can feed themselves and not go into the forest. This is such a big tragedy. Um, he was the lead silverback of Nkuringo Gorilla Group, and now he's died. The group is, doesn't have a leader. We hope that the adult males in the group will take over and lead the group. A few gorillas of his group have gone to join another group nearby that used to be part of that group. And we hope that they'll stabilize soon and continue their life. But we do not want this to happen again. And actually, the tour guides have just, have just been in a webinar with the tour guides, and they're starting a campaign saying, no, don't kill gorillas campaign. And even if the communities are poor and starving, they should not even think about killing a gorilla. And that's what we're really focusing on by improving their, right now providing emergency food support through seedlings. To get more involved in our programs and help us to continue to have a positive impact during the COVID-19 crisis, please sign up for our e-newsletter. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Donate to, to us through the fundraiser. We're so glad the Population Connection did a fundraiser for us, a Giving Tuesday fundraiser. Donate through our website. Um, you can find it. Buy the Gorilla Conservation Coffee. Pangos run out, but they're soon going to place another order once the cargo planes start moving again. And visit us whenever you can. This is our Gorilla Health and Community Conservation Center, built with funding from TASC. And we did some training of the village health teams over here very recently during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thank you much, so much, Population Connection, for supporting us so much over the years. And please follow us also on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and keep supporting our work and keep safe and healthy. Thank you so much for all the great support, Population Connection. <laughs>